welcome back to Bibles for Beginners. Um, if you are new here, go ahead and watch the last episode. We are just now starting in John. Last time we read John 1, 1 through 18. Um, we're going to start in John 1, 19 and read until about 34 today. Um, like I said in the last video, if you do not have a Bible, I strongly suggest an ESV. Um, this is what I have been reading since I became a believer about 10 years ago, and I do think that it is easy to understand. Um, mine is just a journaling Bible because I do enjoy taking notes. I just got this one on Amazon. I've been through about three or four of these once I fill them up and just get a new one. Um, but I love these. There's nothing I love more than a worn used Bible. That being said, it is also great to have one of these on hand. This is also ESV, but it is a study Bible. Um, one thing I love about this is that it really goes into depth on each book. It's going to be a lot if you're a beginner, but it shows maps, it explains timelines. This is something where if you're just starting, it may be a little overwhelming, but it is going to be a fantastic tool for you to use. Let's dive right in. So just reviewing a little bit of what we talked about last time, we're in the book of John, and this can be a little confusing because for some reason there's a John, and then there's a 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. Why they are not just 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, 4th John, I have no idea. Okay, I didn't do it. I, I, I'm not the one that set these rules. But it can be a little confusing if you don't understand that. And so John, it's a book of itself, and then in the very back, of the New Testament, you're going to have 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. We're not looking in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We're just looking at, I guess, the 1st John, the John, one of the Gospels. And so last week we talked about how um, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are the Trinity. They were all together in the beginning of creation. Um, we kind of went into the fact that Jesus is truth, Jesus is light. We really looked into the identity of Jesus. Um, and that's kind of the overarching theme of John as a whole. The theme is that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. And now if you're not familiar with what Messiah is, don't you worry because I actually got the definition. And so I looked up the worldly definition and it means the promised deliverer of the Jewish nation prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. And that is true. Um, throughout the Old Testament, which is also the Hebrew Bible, they speak of a Messiah coming to save them. And that is our Old Testament, so we do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But it can also mean the promised one, the anointed one, and Christ and Savior. And so those are all names that Jesus takes on, the promised one, the anointed one, and our Christ and Savior. And so he is also known as our Messiah. Um, and I think that's something really important to truly understand before diving in. And so this book was also being written to a specific audience. Just like every book in the Bible, they weren't really written originally to be the Bible. They were letters written, stories written to people just to get out the word about Jesus. And so this was specifically written to the people of Ephesus. Um, and it was written to Jew and Gentile. And so if you don't know the difference between Jew and Gentile, um, Jew were all the people of Jewish faith, and Gentiles was everyone else. And so we know that the Jews are God's chosen people, God's chosen race, um, and up until Jesus came, only Jews really had a chance at salvation. And so when Jesus came, he offered salvation up for everybody, and so this was a huge deal to the Gentiles because they had never really had a chance for salvation before. That was the Jews' God. Well, now it's everyone's God. Um, and so, of course, now that Jesus has come, all these people are going and sharing the good news about salvation with everyone, including the Gentiles. And so, we're going to go ahead and get started. Like I said, I'm starting in John 1, 19, and I'll put the verses on the screen for you. But it says, And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask you, him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say for yourself? So, bracketing it up a little bit because they said a lot of names, right? And so John is being questioned. 
um, by by the people. They're like, who is this man? Does he think that he's Christ? Does he th is he does he think he's the Messiah? And of course, he denies that because he's not, and he knows who the Messiah is. But um, it also they ask him if he's Elijah. And so, if you're new to the Bible, you may not know the story of Elijah. And I know that I I was not as caught up to it as I thought I should be. Elijah is a character, not a character, a real person in the Old Testament who never died. And so we're going to look in 2 Kings 2.11. Let me pull that up. And it says, And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. And so Elijah is the only person in the Bible that went to heaven without passing away. And so, so many Jews, they knew their stuff. They knew scripture. This is what they had. Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is what they had and what they believed. And it was their culture and they knew it. And so, they expected Elijah to come back, right? And so, that's why they're asking John the Baptist here, are you Elijah? Because they thought that was more likely than him just being someone preparing away. Going back into it, of course, the next verse says, He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And so John here is using the prophecies from the Old Testament for a reason. Because he knows that his people, these people, knew scripture. And there were so many prophecies in the Old Testament of the coming Messiah. And he knew that he could use scripture to connect with them. And so we're going to look at what he's referencing. It's going to be in Isaiah 43. And it says, Isaiah 43 says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Likewise, lines right up with what it says here. It says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet said. And so here he is. John is paving the way and creating a path for Jesus' ministry. Just like we talked about in the last episode, he was not there to take the place of Jesus. He was not there to take the, um, <laughs> the interest off of Jesus. In no way he's just going to prepare the hearts of people for Jesus. And likewise, this is a beautiful picture of what sharing our salvation can look like for other people. And so it's not our job to save anybody. We're not going to do it. It's just not who we are. But we can pave a way and we can plant seeds in others and in their hearts for Jesus to be able to swoop in and make a difference there. So here he is. He's not, he's denying all. He says, I, I am paving the way for Jesus. That's it. Nothing special. If we read a little bit further, it says, Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And so the beauty of this is that John the Baptist takes this humble approach no matter who he's talking to. He has no sense of being great or honorable or deserving of the thing that God has called him to do. And he even says, I do not deserve to untie his shoe. Um, I just think that's beautiful because obviously he played a huge role in the story. And I think it's also a picture of how God chooses the people whose hearts are in the right place. Um, to, to, to use them. I think all throughout scripture, scripture <laughs> we see that God is choosing the people, the unlikely, the unwanted, the, the people that have a hard time thinking about Moses. Like Moses, he had a stutter. He didn't want to and he ended up leading a nation. God chooses the people who are obedient and willing and humble. It has nothing to do with their talents. And we see that here even with John the Baptist. He's a little quirky. John the Baptist, we can go into it. He was a little bit of a quirky guy. He, he just, he just, ran to his own beat. He jumped a little off about him. But Jesus, God, chose him to pave the way for Jesus. And I think that's crucial to remember. Going on just a little bit more, we're in verse 29 now. It says, The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin in the world. Pause there. Lamb of God? If you're not familiar with this, back 
back. Um, they used to have to use lambs as sacrifices for their sins. And it was a big deal because it had to be a lamb that had no imperfections. I mean, when they were born, they would even cover up their feet and they would sound like this foot. These feet have never touched the ground. I mean, it was a huge deal to have a perfect, clean lamb. And so the picture is that Jesus was our perfect sacrifice because he lived a life with no sin, no blemishes of any kind. And so he was the perfect sacrifice for our sin. And so even here, the people he's talking to, they can't comprehend that Jesus is going to die for their sins. But it's being prophesied that he is the Lamb of God. He is the perfect sacrifice who's going to take the place of our sin. And so every time you read that, Lamb of God, it can directly translate into sacrifices for our sin. And it says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. This is also a direct reference to the fact that Jesus is there and Jesus has always been. Like we said last week when we said that um, in verse 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was there when the world was created. Jesus was there when everything was made. He's always been. He's always been at the right hand of God. But God allowed him to come down in human form to take on the sins of the world. And so I myself did not know him. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed in heaven. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the concept of baptism, I'd love to explain it. And so, at least in my denomination, we believe that baptism is an outward sign to all people um, of a cleansing represented when you repent from your sins. And so, baptizing is a picture, it's like a... A metaphoric picture of what's happening when the old is washed away and the new being is coming. Like we said last week, you were born again when you become a Christian. Um, you start over, the Holy Spirit lives into you. And that's a big deal. And so baptism is a picture of that, of your obedience in a way. And so as I saw the Spirit descend from the heaven like a dove and it remained on him. It remained on him. So the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus and it didn't come and leave. It stayed. And so Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit when it came down on him. It says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so John the Baptist knew that Jesus had come to save the world, that he was the Messiah, and that he was going to baptize with the Holy Spirit because he saw with his own eyes the Holy Spirit come upon him. And then it says, And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now this is something you cannot say lightly. It's a big deal. If you're claiming that someone is the Son of God, especially to a group of Jewish believers and people, and this is their culture, and this is who they are, and this is their Messiah, and they've been waiting for this, you can't say that lightly. And so when he says that this is the Son of God, that's a big deal, and that turns head, and that upset a lot of people. And so we know that John not only is, he has to be bold about his faith to be doing this, but he knows his stuff. He knows his scripture. He knows that the people he's talking to know their scripture. Um, and he knows and believes truly what he's doing. And so that is a little bit of uh, John for you. I know that was a lot. I talk fast. We basically just read through John 1, 1, 19 through 34. And the next episode will go just a little bit farther. And John, if you have any questions, feel free to comment those for me. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me. This is something I truly love to do. And I, I just love that I have the opportunity to do this on this platform. Um, if you don't already, make sure you subscribe. Join me over on TikTok. We can hang out there. It has been a joy hanging out with you, and I hope to see you soon.